I propose that we say goodbye. I propose that we say goodbye just to get it over with the moment we first meet. I propose that we begin weeping at the beginnings of all things just to acknowledge their inevitable ends. I propose that we throw rice at the dead when they are carried out of the cathedrals and bury the bride and groom in the cemetery immediately after they kiss. I propose that we allow our cities to sink instead of trying to prop them back up again. And then we turn into fish and swim instead of running to the hills, looking over our shoulders at what was and what could have been by the sea. And I propose that we make love right away and then spend the rest of our time together seducing each other unapologetically with no memory of the mistakes our bodies have already made with each other and with others in the dark. Every evening about this time, every evening about this time, a man and a woman who are not bank robbers sit at their dining table and imagine together that they are bank robbers. <laughs> they discuss which banks they would rob if they robbed the banks, how they would distract the guards, what they would say to the tellers every evening about this time. They watch scenes from movies about bank robberies and discuss what went wrong and the ones that went wrong what could have gone wrong in the ones that went right. They talk about how they would have done things differently if they were bank robbers every evening about this time. Sometimes the man gets up and demonstrates how he would unwrap the gun as fast from the flower box as fast as or faster than Al Pacino unwrapped it in Dog Day Afternoon. And the woman laughs. She shows him how she would chew her gum, the way she would tie her hair up in her scarf so she wouldn't be recognized after the robbery every evening about this time. Every evening about this time, the man and the woman who are not bank robbers discuss the relative merits of putting the bags of money in the back seat versus in the trunk and wonder how heavy those bags will be. You might have to carry them yourself, the woman says. But my hernia, the man groans. So they figure out who would drive and in which direction, where they would abandon the Impala for a newer car, how they would switch plates if necessary. And then every evening about this time, the man and woman who are not bank robbers are quiet for a few moments. The man finishes what's left in his glass and the woman pours herself a little more. And finally, they both get up at the same time as if choreographed, like the good bank robbers they would be if they were bank robbers. And the man says, well, I'm going to bed. And the woman joins him in saying his next words exactly as he says them, I have to work early tomorrow. And then the man goes off to bed, hoping he dreams of the perfect getaway in the perfect getaway car. And every evening about this time, the woman stays up for a little while longer, wondering which pictures of her they'll use for the wanted posters. <laughs> These are all from a, I finished three manuscripts this week, weirdly enough, but wow. I don't know, I don't, they're not all new poems, but they're, it took me a while to put them together. And this is from one of those manuscripts. Café Verité. The man who just ordered a skin latte and sat down by the window is being murdered by his ex-wife, but he isn't even married to her yet. She's calling him a liar and a cheat and beating her fist against his chest and clawing at his eyes and finally strangling him as he looks at her as if he cannot believe that this is his end. He sips his latte and stares out the window. And then across the cafe, and then across the cafe, the legs of the woman licking the berries from her muffin off her fingertips. She's hooked to a machine and staring up at a daughter she doesn't even know now, a daughter she doesn't even know she's going to have who is stroking her hand and telling her how beautiful she is. And she is at this moment, with the sun through the cafe window and her legs crossed and then uncrossed, as if there's all the time in the world for cafes and muffins and her tan thighs, as the barista's car is going off the road just outside his hometown. It's a road he's driven hundreds of times, but this time there's a song on the radio he hasn't heard since those days long ago when he worked in that coffee shop with that other barista he just remembered moments before he lost control of the car. Those eyes, those lips, and, the mo and that one time they kissed after hours with the chairs up on the tables and the cafe empty 
And there she is now, just getting to work an hour ap after her shift was supposed to start. There she is, standing on the sidewalk, finishing a phone call, making faces at someone's baby. No wonder the thought of her would make a man drive off the road, even years from now. And apparently she might be the only one of us who will live forever. She's so radiant out there on the other side of this door, as our worlds in here crash into their own private ends. And I know that I'm, a, I'm not alone when I try to make my eyes plead with her to stay out there, unfazed and undying, to please stay out there, where forever is still a possibility not to walk into this cafe of our final truths. But she does. And we all cannot help but look up, wondering if we'll catch a glimpse of her inevitability, if we'll see how horrible it will be for her too, and when, or maybe we'll at least glimpse a little sliver of that skin between her jeans and her sweater, and we'll forget each other's tomorrow and our own tomorrows, while we still have the luxury of such a distraction to forget about tomorrow. Seven, you got eight five. Okay. A very famous restaurant. Oops, that's not what I'm reading. Sorry. What never happened is happening again. Number three. You don't know the first two, so it doesn't matter that I said number three. <laughs> when you see her again, as you often see her again, years after her murder. She's about the same age she was when you couldn't get enough of her, on a narrow bed in Paris, on a narrow bed in Crete, on a narrow bed in Amsterdam, on a narrow bed in Paris. And she's walking with friends, her arms are locked in theirs, and they're all laughing. She and they have no idea that she will be murdered, just as she and you had no idea back then that she would be murdered, when you kissed in Père Lachaise, when you kissed outside Notre Dame, when you kissed by the Aegean Sea. She's walking with her friends, and she does not see you, or pretend she does not see you. And you look away, afraid that you might commit the atrocity of telling her what you wish you couldn't possibly know. What never happened is happening again for... My brother who died at 22 is almost 50 now. He blew his brains out, or his wife did, more years ago than he was on this earth. And now he is no longer young, and he works at a machine shop, or maybe he just retired or is on disability, after a machine he had used for decades mangled his fingers, as if those fingers did not know how to work the machine, or as if the machine were punishing those fingers for pulling the trigger that night, or for not successfully prying the gun from his wife. And she has married and divorced and married again, and my brother has stayed alone in a rented apartment on the other side of the mousetrap factory, and his son, who was only two when he last saw him bloody and instantly dead on the floor of that apartment, is older now than my brother ever was. And he does not recognize his father when they pass each other in the aisles of the Walmart. He does not know if it's him, he does not know it's him from any other withered man, and why would he, this many years since his death? But I see my long dead brother loading bags into the trunk of his still primer gray, still jacked up Chevelle with a cigarette burning down to nothing between his teeth. And no knowledge of what he did when he was just barely not a boy, now that he is an almost old man. As if it is something that never happened. As if his eyes aren't the same blue as that sky was that day I learned what happened the night before. It's probably going to end up being three books about a scarecrow, and um, I'll just introduce you to the scarecrow tonight. If the scarecrow weren't a scarecrow, if the scarecrow weren't a scarecrow, he might be a strolling violinist who appears at your table and waits for you to fall in love with your wife again, or to wave him off anyway with a dollar bill, or he might be a ship's captain standing on the bow of his ship, looking out across the water, looking toward a place he once thought of as home. The scarecrow might be a glass of water in a thirsty man's hand, 
or a set of keys to an ex-lover's apartment, keys you don't know if you'll ever be able to take off the hook inside your door if the scarecrow weren't a scarecrow. He might know a lot about oceans or how to swim across oceans. He might be a little boy running up to the waves and then away, up to the waves and then away if the scarecrow weren't a scarecrow. He might pass a scarecrow from a car on some back road and barely notice the scarecrow out there, looking almost like a falling down man. Or if he does notice, he might wonder for a moment what it must be like to stand that still and then switch the radio station and start singing along. Having completely forgotten about the scarecrow back there before the chorus, before more than a couple miles have gone by, if the scarecrow weren't a scarecrow. He might be you or he might be me, or he might just be someone else who is neither you nor me. Someone perhaps who does not even know that he or she is not a scarecrow and never was one, perhaps at all. Who does not feel the pang of not being who he or she might have been as you and I and the scarecrow feel such a pang every time we consider how things and we might have been different. That's okay. That's okay. You don't know me from Jim. Okay. Daughters. The scarecrow has no daughter, nor son for that matter. He is neither lain with a woman nor contemplated starting a family with her. The scarecrow has not been surprised by a sudden pregnancy when he thought he could never have children because he is a scarecrow. There are many things scarecrows will never do, but as a daughter he would miss most were the scarecrow able to consider what he does and does not have. The years go by so fast, and sometimes the afternoon sun barely moves. If the scarecrow had a daughter, he would see her at the end of the day. She would come running to him, dropping her school books. She'd tell him everything that happened in her whole long time of being away from him. If the scarecrow had a daughter, she would hug him and hug him until it felt like his head just might pop off. <laughs> just going to read one one poem from an earlier book and uh, yeah one this is called Tuesday 9 a.m. a man standing at the bus stop reading the newspaper is on fire flames are peeking out from beneath his collar and cuffs his shoes have begun to melt the woman next to him wants to mention it to him that he is burning but he but she is drowning water is everywhere in her mouth and ears, in her eyes, a stream of water runs steadily from her blouse. Another woman stands at the bus stop freezing to death. She tries to stand near the man who is on fire to melt the icicles that have formed on her eyelashes and on her nostrils to stop her teeth long enough from chattering to say something to the woman who is drowning. But the woman who is freezing to death has trouble moving with blocks of ice on her feet. It takes the three some time to board the bus, what with the flames, and water and ice. But when they finally climb the stairs and take their seats, the driver doesn't even notice that none of them has paid because he is tortured by visions and is wondering if the man who got off at the last stop was really being mauled to death by wild dogs. Oh. Goodbye you. Goodbye to you now. You who issued kisses to my lower and upper halves. You who called the cows home to roost in the high trees of my saddest thoughts. You who called me wind and said, blow my dress off. You who chased away my disgust, my despair, my disrepair, goodbye. You whose secret fre freckles I have discovered and charted on the maps for the ages. You who allowed me to be the cartographer of your terrain, goodbye. You whose maps I made and studied and revised upon second and third and three thousandth expedition goodbye. You whose seas I can't imagine another sailing, whose forests I cannot ima imagine another traipsing, whose freckles I cannot imagine another contemplating, goodbye. I'll be right back. I'm just going to get some wine. <laughs>